Sesame Street has been on the air for 50 something years. And in the early days of Sesame Street, one of the kids who was a regular on the show was John John. He started when he was three years old and they pulled him right in because John John just had a way of being totally at home with all the Muppets. He talked to them like they were people and they said he often had these really funny, unpredictable interactions, especially with Harry Monster. And the clip that sticks out in my mind about John John, three-year-old John John and Harry Monster is one when they are counting together. And they get to, they're gonna take turns and John John says, well, I wanna go first, but then they don't take turns. John John just counts all of the ones. And so Harry Monster just joins in and counts with him. And he gets a little stuck when he gets to 15. And then he gets really excited when he remembers 16, 17, you know, it's big and it's emotive and Harry Monster just goes right there with him. And then he gets to 19 and he says, I can't remember what comes next. And then the clip cuts and Sesame Street, again, because it's been on the air for 50 something years, has this beautiful ability to cut to 20 years later. And there is not John John, but John, grown up in his Air Force uniform. And Harry Monster says, hey, for old time's sake, John, it's so good to see you again. I love seeing you all grown up for old time's sake. What if we count again? And so Harry Monster and John John, John Williams, begin counting again together. Grown up from little tiny guy, toddler, to a grown up counting together. This is such a beautiful, unique thing to be able to zoom out and see all of the pieces of time at once from the start of the story to somewhere farther along this beautiful life so full of potential to look at that little boy and he grew up and he just lived fully and sought his dreams and came back to Sesame Street. And when we look at scripture, we get this benefit too. We have the benefit of being able to back up and see all things at once. We see that story from Genesis, the one we didn't read, about Sarah and Abraham being called. And as I mentioned before, from them, uh, Abraham, the, the, they call him the father of three faiths, the parents of three faiths. From him, Judaism began. And then, of course, thus then, Christianity and his son Ishmael being the start of the faith of Islam. And then we get to jump ahead, jump way ahead to Jesus doing this healing work in scripture, the fulfillment of the potential of this moment seen so much later and by us seeing the whole thing of it. And when I was little, I loved that story of the woman who's like, if I can just touch him, then I, if I can just touch the tassels on his cloak, I will be healed. I loved that. I clung to that. And that's what I always wanted too, was when the hard things happened for there to be the big rescue moment, the big healing moment, the big like God not being an underachiever reaching in and doing the good work moment. I was in high school and there was a boy who um, also went to church camp. We weren't particularly close, but I knew him, George. And um, one day, I think it was maybe a month after camp, uh, there was a big rain and George and a couple of his buddies decided to try to swim across a swollen creek and George was swept away. And there was this time of unknowing, like may maybe he could be okay. And I tell you what, I'm not sure I've ever prayed harder in my life. I'm not sure I have ever believed a miracle was possible more in my whole life. I thought, I really thought like maybe George could be okay. And if there was, I tell you, all of those church camp kids <laughs> praying our little hearts out, if there was, if you could have enough faith, if you could pray in a way to save someone's life, boy, we could have done it. But that is not what happened. George didn't make it. I remember also a time when I was in college um, and I lost a dear, dear friend. Um, he died by suicide and I began really struggling after that with um, panic and like, oh gosh, I suddenly feel very unsure of what happens after we die. 
I don't know if there is a concrete heaven where we get to go and we get to see all these people that we love and we've lost again. And so I scheduled a meeting with Holly, my pastor, because I was like, she's going to tell me. She's going to make it all be okay. She is going to be my rescue button, escape hatch. And I sat down with Holly, and it was, I think, the most powerful moment of pastoral care I've ever experienced in my life because I said all of these things that I was afraid of, and she said, that is so hard. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what happens. And that is, it's hard and it's scary. There was someone else that I spoke to after that happened. She didn't realize the nature of the death. She was, I guess, a kind of a life coach person, very kind woman from my college. And when I talked to her, she was trying to comfort me. She was trying to be that actual escape hatch. It's gonna be okay because she said, don't you think all things happen for a reason? And I had been wrestling with that. And in that moment, I had never felt more certain that unequivocally, no, I do not believe all things happen for a reason. That no, that is not where God is in the story. I believe that God's in the story, but it's not there. It's not in the senseless, awful, the senseless pain that happens. That ain't it. And the way the world is, the way life is, gosh, life is undeniably beautiful, undeniably beautiful. Just take yesterday, for instance, yesterday in Kansas City, which I can't help but think that this was some major scheduling snafu that like this hand didn't talk to this hand, didn't talk to that hand over there because yesterday on the plaza, there was the Dragon Boat Race Festival, which is this huge Chinese celebration where people race the dragon boats along Brush Creek. And then up on the street from Brush Creek, there was the Pride Parade happy happening at the exact same time and the pride parade went across the plaza and it went to Tees Park where the pride festival was happening and there are literal rainbows signs of God's hope at every turn everywhere you look is hope and joy and people living and owning themselves and then just up the hill from Tees Park at the Nelson Atkins Museum was the celebration of Juneteenth the day the final people who were enslaved were finally freed three years after the war. And that's where some of us from Peace found ourselves. We were at a, uh, a storytelling event yesterday, and there was a man who stood up there. He was wearing a, a Buffalo Soldier uniform, and he was telling of his own history, of his, his um, ancestor, who was, in fact, a Buffalo Soldier, who started his life without rights, without um, agency and ended his life in a position of authority in this country. And at the end of his talk, he looked around at everyone and he made eye contact, especially with the little kids in the room and said, don't you ever let anybody tell you that you are not a vital part of the fabric of this beautiful nation, that you are not a part of making something that was more beautiful than when you found it. It was beautiful. And life is also so beautiful brutal. There are the senseless things that happen to us personally, that happen to people that we love, that we, we can try our whole lives to make sense of them, but they're just never going to make sense. They're going to hurt and they're going to be painful. There is legislation that is power grabs to try to take ownership over, to try to take away people's agency, to try to take away their ability to be their full selves. There are, There is our sweet, ailing, beautiful planet that is burning north of us, and that is just ravaged, you know, flooding in, in Ukraine due to acts of terror. And it's just, it's just so much. And here is the really difficult part about this scripture. It's difficult because I think, I think we miss it in the big, you know, sweeping mystery of it. Jesus is doing the healing and we got the magic healing things happen and we miss what's really happening here. What's really happening is we have the story of three people who are on the outsides who are being brought in. It's not a story, the whole of scripture, the whole of Jesus's ministry is not a story of Jesus coming in and fixing everything. Jesus is not taking away all disease and misery. Jesus is not making all injustice go away, but Jesus is showing up 
in these lives in these small ways and doing acts of hope, bringing people who were outside of community back into community, back into the restoration of the whole. The thing is, there is no amount of believing the right way or praying the right way that's going to fix the things that hurt the most in this world. I wish there was. I really, I really wish there was. Think about what we could get done if we could just pray enough to make it so. But we all know, thoughts and prayers, it's never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever enough. And I really want an escape hatch. I really want the, the rescue to swing in, the big healing, sweeping work to swing in and take us all out of the, the hardest parts of this. And I really want, this is the point in the, in the you know, talk today, when we, we want to find this, we want the story of hope. The one, we want the miracle, this is where the miracle story goes. It goes right here. But we don't have a big miracle story. We have a story about pots and pans. Brenda grew up in a family that before she was born, they had immigrated from Jamaica to London and they just didn't have much money. Her mom, I mean, they scrimped and saved so much that her mom, when she went to the butcher, was like, give me the scraps, give me all of the tiny leftover pieces. And Brenda said from that, her, her mom would make magic, just these amazing foods that were so satisfying and so filled with love. And her mom, cooking was important to her. And so one day when a door-to-door -door salesman came selling pots and pans, there was a set that he was selling that had everything. It had all of the colanders and the lids and all of the sizes of pots and pans that you could imagine. And so Brenda's mom worked out a big payment plan situation with this man. And from the age that when Brenda was three to when she was six, somehow they worked out how to pay for these pots and pans. And they came one day in the big box. And so they very carefully took them out of the box. Oh, Brenda just loved looking at all of these pots and pans. And after they'd gone through them all, Brenda's mom put them back in the box and put them up on the refrigerator. And every time Brenda would ask, like, can we just, just once, can we just use these pots and pans? Her mom would always say, not yet. We're not, re I'm not ready. I'm not ready to use those pots and pans. Not yet, not yet. And then when they immigrated some years later, 10 years later to the United States from London, the box was tattered and so Brenda's mom got a new box and repacked them all and they brought them and she put them on the top of the refrigerator in New Jersey and there they sat until the day that Brenda got married to a highly educated man and her mom gave her the box of pots and pans and Brenda's husband didn't really get it because they weren't Teflon, they weren't like Le Creuset, they were really basic pots and pans, nothing fancy. And she felt like those pots and pans weren't worthy of being in her new home. And then she said after some time, she felt like she wasn't worthy of being in her new home. And so their 14 years went by by the time she got married to when she ended up um, getting a divorce and moving out and taking those pots and pans with her. And it was only then on her own that she decided that she was worthy and she started using the pots and pans every single day. And she burned the bottoms and she dented them and they were tossed, or, I mean, they were just, they were used, thoroughly used. And her friends would come over and eat with her and she would cook with them and they'd sit around the table. And the thing is, the story isn't about the pots and pans. The scripture isn't about the magic miracle healing. It's about worth and wholeness. And, not, and seeing it in one another and seeing it in ourselves, recognizing our own worth and value and belovedness. And then there's something more to it too. I was talking with a friend recently, a very wise ministry colleague, and um, just saying how like, ill-equipped I feel, I probably shouldn't, probably shouldn't say this out loud, how ill-equipped I feel to do pastoral care, to speak into your lives, to sit with you in your hard moments. And he said something so brilliant. He said, oh gosh, he was like, what I often think of is that it's not our job to fix things. It's our job to not look away from the things that most people want to look away from. There it all is. It is hard to face the hardest parts of the world with honesty, knowing that 
we're not going to be able to fix all of the things. We're not going to be able to heal all the sicknesses or all of the injustices in the world. And you know what? It's not our job either. Our call is to show up authentically, to be present, to abide with one another. That's the healing work. So we are called today to not be alone, to look at the hardest of the hearts, to look at the darkness, and to know that we are together and that God is along with us. So may we look at the hard and not turn away. May we be courageous in finding some love and some grace and some mercy there and finding that in drawing ourselves in, drawing our communities together by our faith indeed, we may be made whole. Amen.